Everyone, welcome to another edition of Founder Wisdom Podcast. Today with us, we have Jason Long. He is CEO and founder of Tangent Solutions and a bunch of other cool businesses that we are going to discuss today. So Jason, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your day-to-day? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Jason Long. I'm the CEO of Tangent Solutions. I am also the operating CEO of a company called Experience Care, which I'll get to in just a second. Uh, I own a, a portfolio of software as a service, productized services, agency, and outsourcing businesses. And day to day, I work as a uh, as a hired gun CEO for private equity groups uh, with distressed assets. Okay, so I mean, you you own a bunch of SaaS uh, businesses. How did that came about? Why did you decided to go for um, that business strategy? Uh, why not you know focus on on one startup? Oh, that's <laughs> so. In the beginning, I did focus on one startup. Uh, I started my first marketing agency in 2021, uh, 2020. Is yeah. that right? No, not 2020, 2000. My bad, 2000, not 2020. <laughs> that's, 2000. That's so a 20, long time 22 ago. 22 years ago. My yeah. bad. Uh, and so. Uh, It started off as one business, and it between 2020 and 2007, it grew to be about 30 full-time people, and then it crashed and burned in the 2007-2008 market downturn, Mm -hmm. and that was really, really, really painful uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, But during that time, uh, or I yeah, during that time, I decided. I'm never, ever going to be in that position again. And so rather than just having one single thing, I ended up starting a number of businesses that gave me semi-passive or passive income or or non-passive income. Okay. And uh, I worked for years to get those businesses set up before I was able to step away and do do other things. So you put your duck eggs in various baskets. Exactly. Well, it just... Yeah, if something fails, there's there's always a fall over. If something goes, you know, completely bust, I'm not I'm not that concerned about it. I mean, I'm concerned, but it's not like I'm I'm gonna be out looking for a job or something. Sure, sure, sure. So pre-interview, we talked about you know your pretty tight um, schedule. So you're you're like tight on schedule and time management, uh, sort of. So how does one manage all of that in one day? Like how much time do you spend at experience care? What time do you get up? And how do you manage your other uh, portfolio companies? Great question. Uh, so I usually wake up at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, I take, uh, I get my daughter up, who's a year and three months, and we go for a walk and I get a cup of coffee while we're out. Usually sit and play with her for a little while. And then around eight o'clock, uh, sorry, eight eight thirty. Um, I will get my day started. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of my time is on my day to day work at Experience Care. So okay. that's uh, that was a distressed asset. It's it's you know in the last couple of years we've ten x sales in that business. We've uh, you know cut churn by sixty six percent or more. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've we, you know made some pretty substantial improvements there. So, but still my day to day is over there. Uh, the way that I manage all of my other businesses, though, is either for some businesses, depends on, on what stage they're at. Some businesses, it's just a weekly check-in with whoever the leader for that business is. Uh, other businesses, it's every other week. Some businesses I rarely talk to anymore. Okay. Uh, there's one of my one of my outsourcing companies. I I get emails from them, but I pretty much never talk to them anymore. Okay. Uh, and so, and, and that business does does fantastic. Uh, okay. I also use a mixture of traction, the book traction, and uh, to, to set forth things like the, the mission, vision, uh, I use the people analyzer a lot, et cetera, or the executives I put in place use those tools. And then I manage the day-to-day um, goals with OKRs from um, Measure What Matters. And that's been a really, really effective tool in understanding what's happening at all the different businesses, keeping executives on track, making sure that I understand what's happening, they understand what's happening, where the company's going, how things are doing. And I can look in on those goals at any given time and see how those businesses are doing. And for some businesses, especially newer ones, I'll step into their weekly meeting and just take a look and see how the goals are moving along. And for other businesses, you know, that's not as necessary. And I also would like to point out that 
I've started a lot of businesses. Not everything has worked. Some sure. some things have have gone great, and some things have failed, or we've closed them up. And yeah. you know that's the way it goes. Yeah, that's the way it goes. I just finished um, an interview before yours from a startup studios, and they they claim well, it's bold on their website that ninety uh, percent of startups don't make it at their uh, startup studios. So, I guess that's kind of part of the game uh, with SaaS and bootstrap types of businesses. I guess it's it's less, and uh, especially if you have control on the ideas and execution. But still, it's pretty uh, it's, it's a pretty high failure rate, and we need to to be at ease with that. Um, I have a question related to your OKRs and KPIs and the team. So, what do you do if um, uh, a leader keeps on missing his OKRs, KPIs. What type of conversation do you have with them? How does EQ and empathy comes in? And when do you fire that person from just repeating uh, bad performances? So I've had one situation where that happened. Uh, it lasted five months and it was an executive that was not, not getting things done well or not getting things done i think is probably a better way to put it and at the end of the day i just said i'm not fun like the, co the company wasn't at profit by that point uh and i just said i'm not funding the business anymore and okay. we you know we just agreed that we were going to close it up and that was that um okay. you know i really like looking at it i should have pulled the trigger on on killing it after two months yeah. like that that's you know i i had made a commitment to give it six months but I, I knew early on it wasn't going well, and I really should have have stopped funding it after two months. I, it's it's one of these things I kind of kicked myself over, but a good lesson to learn. So was that a CEO because you managed these CEOs that managed the, your portfolio of business, right? Exactly. It was a CEO. Yes. Okay. And uh, did you acquire that one? Was What was the pre-scenario leading to that? That was a business that I had started... I don't know, maybe 10 years earlier okay. that was struggle that, that worked out well when I was leading it, but it was never, it never had great growth. Okay. It had very, very slow growth and it was kind of a break-even business. I brought in a, uh, a new uh, executive into that business with the hopes of revitalizing the business. Okay. But at the end of the day, it was a business that was going to be way too hard to really get going anyway. And mm. so uh, the moving into bringing that new executive in, it was kind of my last ditch effort on that business. Okay. Uh, you know, it was one of these things where I said, if, if this person doesn't work out, I'm closing it up anyway, because it's costing me too much time. Yeah. And to me, what I understood from my last questions about OKRs and KPIs is that you hire slow. You do your due diligence before you hire a CEO. You make sure that they're a full fit for the job, right? Yep. That's like 90% of the equation. Then you don't have to worry about like uh, OKRs and uh, KPIs achievement. Um, in terms of hiring CEOs, I, I want to have my portfolio of companies managed by their respective CEOs. <clears throat> I'm on the path to that. Um, what uh, would you recommend in terms of compensation? You have a general number in mind that you should give them around six figures and probably uh, shares of the business. How do you operate with that? Oh, it's a great question. Okay, so let, that that has to do with the way that I start up businesses. So let, let me talk about how things get started, mm -hmm. and then I'll talk about the compensation. Yeah. So the way that these days, you know, I've been doing this for twenty something years now. These days, I feel like I do a pretty good job knowing what businesses are going to work and which aren't going to work. I, I failed at enough businesses mm -hmm. to know to know that. Okay. And so. What I do is I have a, I have a business startup team that I pull from other from some of my businesses. Different people come together. We uh, you know the idea you know we have the idea from whatever it could be a million different places. Uh, so we we put together some basic stuff around it. We validate the idea. We validate the sales process. We validate the distribution. We make sure that the business is going to work and that it can gain traction quickly. Okay. Almost everything I do these days is really, really simple stuff. You know, okay. nothing big, nothing too complicated, but something that I can spin up really quickly. I can test it and validate it really quickly. It doesn't have a high startup cost and it has a very high profitability. You know, something where within six or eight months, we can be pulling in 50 or $60,000 per month. And within two years, we can be pulling in 
$150,000 per year. At least it has to have, or $150,000 per month. It has to at least have that potential. Uh, and and with, the, with that, something that has a very high margin as well. You know, where, where you're looking, I wouldn't do anything that has less than a 50% margin on that. And I don't mean gross gross margin. I mean, like, like I'm making 50% on that. Are you talking so, like mostly service-based, like an agency or even an old school construction company? Or do you go SaaS? Because to me, what you're mentioning here, in my mind, it's like agencies. So it can be all sorts of things. So one of the things to keep in mind is that with, with my agency, we build a lot of software, a lot, a lot, a lot of software. And a lot of times what we see is an opportunity, not for not to take somebody's software that we built for them, but we, we take a look and we go, oh, this other industry needs this idea that we built in this industry because we're very broad. We're across many industries. And we realize there's this little piece coming across. We have a team that just got done building that thing. And it might not be yeah. perfect, but what we'll do is we'll say, okay, cool. Let's rebuild this thing, but for this particular industry in this particular way. So we can still produce software very, very, very quickly. And we, we the JH Media Group is a SaaS build company. Okay. So what we do is we go all the way from, from feasibility and validation all the way to taking things to market for everything from funded entrepreneurs to, uh, to mid-market companies. Okay. And so we, we have a, a foundation that we can, we can spin things up really, really quickly. So are you so, talking mostly B2C or B2B ideas? B2B. We, yeah, we B2B are B2B always exclusively B2B. Okay, yeah, we perfect. We do, personally, I do almost nothing in B2C. Except for for you know like I, I still I work B two B in B two C, but that's it. So so we have a, a validation group that comes together within the business, validates the idea. If it's going to work, fantastic. We get you know then then put that into the chunk of ideas. Like yep, that's going to go. And then for um, uh, and then at that point we have something that we know is going to work. We know is going to go. Uh, we can see how it's going to go. And then we, I start looking for an executive to take it over. Okay. So at that point, um, uh, I usually, uh, I know going in that we're going to bring in an executive that's going to have equity stake in the business. Okay. So the, um, uh, what was I going to say? So usually I have a list of people that I want to work with, you know, okay. people that I've met over the course of years and wow. uh, that I've met at different different events, other other executives, other CEOs, other other business people, and I'll kind of pull from that list and just say, hey, look, you know, I got this idea, it's validated, I got the website up and running, we have a minimal amount of revenue coming in, but I need somebody that wants to lead it. That how wants big is that list? Is it like hundred individuals? And how do you know that? Well, they probably oh, already like, have a job. It's like, uh, well, I have a pretty large network of uh, of entrepreneur friends. Like, if, I would say I have an exceptionally large network of entrepreneur friends. So I would say mm -hmm. definitely in the hundreds of people. Yeah. And of those hundreds of people, maybe 20 or 30, that at any given time, I might give them a call and say, hey, what, okay. what are you, how's that current business going? What, what's, what's up with what you're doing right now? Yeah. And, um, and go from there. Okay, so you'll post uh, something on LinkedIn slash call them up with for to discuss that big ideas. Um, they're entrepreneurial. How do you know that the salary that you'll offer them will be interesting at this point of their career? So it, it's almost never talking. We don't talk about a salary. Talk okay. about the growth of the business. I'm not in, pe in having people that need a salary to Go come ahead. in to do this. I want somebody who's in a position where they're, where they're way more interested in generating wealth than, than generating, you know, like a salary. Like, like a it. salary position you know, the, the people I'm talking to, for the most part, are pretty well set. They can live okay. for years and years or indefinitely with no salary. Okay. Uh, or they can generate, if they need to generate, you know, get by money, they can do it very, very easily. They're, that's not the kind of people I'm pitching to. Got so, it. So the idea is always already established, the concept as well. You, you have a, a proof of concept right there and you're like okay i'm gonna give you 20 to 30 percent of that that could be worth uh your part could be worth like five to eight millions in like five years is that the type of deal or exactly so what we do is we put it together where you know at uh you know we, we create a plan around uh around what we're doing and we say um uh you know we should be at revenue by this point 
And the first person that gets a salary off of this revenue is, you know, sometimes it's that person, but sometimes it, we got to bring on a VA or we got to bring on a, a whatever, right? Okay. But the first person in general that's going to get a salary is that person. It's going to be based on the number of sales for that business up to a certain point. And then once that person- You mean the covered, CEO, right? Will be the first paid? Yeah. Okay, got exactly. it. Uh, you know, sometimes we have other smaller uh, roles that have to get paid yeah. right out the gate. Yeah. But usually the person I'm bringing in is somebody that can get on the phone and do a sale. They, yeah. if this is somebody that has entrepreneurial experience. They know what to do to make that stuff happen. I'll yeah. help them out. I'll get them going on the different pieces if they, you know, but we're bringing on people that know what they're doing. Okay. So, you know, they, they make a salary up to X amount or they have a, a staggered salary going up. So let's say we have okay. a, a product right now. We're spinning one up where we're expecting to hit 10K MRR. It's not MRR, 10K AOV, not AOV. That's not right. 10K per month, let's just put it that way, yeah. uh, within the next uh, two months, two yeah. or three months. Yeah. Like 5K out of that is going to go to the CEO to begin with, and the yeah. other 5K goes to operation. Uh, connection is lagging, Jason. Just let's give it a second here other people if we hit 20k though there we go where did, where did you lose back, yeah. Lose um yeah the okay so 10k a month 5k goes to the ceos and then i guess after that it kind of diminishes so let's say you guys hit uh 20 a month then it will be like 7.5k in his pockets or something like that so if we were to hit yeah exactly but it's it steps up over time Okay. So it depends on what the business is. It depends on what's necessary. Like maybe we have to bring in a senior salesperson and that's going to cost us okay. 10K per month plus okay. commissions okay. or something like, you know, mm -hmm. but, or in this particular case, this CEO, the one I'm thinking of right now, she's probably going to hit 10K pretty fast. Okay. And then above that, then we have the operations of the business and then we have uh, disbursements for the company. But okay. pretty quickly after hitting 20K on the business, that business doesn't need a whole lot more people after that. Like it's going to okay. run for a while at, at a cost of 20 to 30 K per month. Okay. Even if the company is doing 200 or 300 K per month, mm -hmm. it's still going to keep operating at around 30 K per month. Okay. So, you know, and so the, the deal is after, after we hit this particular, you know, whatever that number is, everything above that, that, that executive and I just split that on either a monthly or quarterly basis okay. beyond there. Okay, I get it. Um, two questions arise from that. So one, my first piece of understanding is, I mean, you have a, a huge network um, and people trust you, obviously. So when you come up to them with an idea, because the proof of concept, I mean, I want to discuss a bit more about that product market fit, your definition and so forth. But my first my first understanding is that, okay, they know Jason, they know that he's been doing that for a while. If Jason has an idea, it's going to make money. That's why I'm I'm gonna try it. Is that the the mindset that they have initially? Because the the follow up the follow up question is why wouldn't they start it themselves? You know, because they don't have a, a proof of concept. They they just don't have the idea, and they're good at executing. They're more they're better at operation than having the vision. Is that it? Good question. Uh, it's usually that I have the distribution and the connections. Like that, that's usually the distribution is usually the hardest piece. You know, it's start getting something started, going from zero to one. It's all about sales. Yeah. And so if I've got the sales lined up, mm -hmm. then it, it doesn't make sense for most people to get it started. The, the other side of it is that I also have a lot of resources I bring to the table. So it's not like they can, they can, you know, most people can just go ahead and start these kinds of things up. It still takes tens of thousands of dollars yeah. in just, you know, spinning up the business, spinning yeah. up all the resources, getting all the, the you know, the, the software in place, getting the people in place. I fund all of that to begin with. Got so, it. you know, if, if we do need, you know, VAs or we need designers, we need uh, developers, I have all of that within my, within my, my companies already. And so I okay. can just pull people to get things done. Yeah. So it makes you're, a lot of sense. You're the idea guy, you're the vision guy, you're the starting guy, the startup guy, the founder guy, kind of, and they're more um, operational because the, the question is, you know, and I wrote that in my trailer yesterday, I wrote, I write down a hundred pieces of ideas and um, I think, well, I don't want to call it that way, but like we want to have the bigger end of the stick, uh, like let's say more than 60% of the the equity. And I mean, some people don't want to have the bigger end of the stick because they're less risk averse. That's one. 
but you know like to me it still raised the, the question if that uh, ceo is, is super talented why doesn't he start his own thing and how can i justify me owning uh 60 of the thing vs him only owning like five to 20 percent of the thing yeah so it, it's what i said i fund it you know like that that's you know i'm putting my money where my mouth but is. they're pretty time. wealthy also you you mentioned that to me you know so yeah. It's just that they, they're not, they're risk averse kind of, they're like unsure and you, you crack the starting part, the ignition part type of. You know, I, I think it's actually has a lot to do also with what's expected of the person. So okay. the, there's one other, there's, there's two things. Actually, you brought up the operations side versus yeah. the vision side. Yeah. I'm definitely the vision guy and I'm definitely the startup guy. The day-to-day -day operations is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who wants to run it every single day, okay. but There's another angle to this that's really important to yeah. remember. The, when I go to pitch people on running these businesses, it's not a forever job. Okay. Like their job is to get it in, get the operations set up, get the processes in place, run the business for six months, a year, two years, whatever it may be, and then put in place all of the different systems that so that they're only working zero to 15 hours a week. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. The, the zero to five is kind of hard. Um, and even then, for example, my uh, agency business, I do that with a CEO. And sometimes I'm like almost at unease of, you know, like that person not spending a lot of time in my business. I'm like, okay, yeah, he gets this recurring, but that, that was part of the deal too, you know? It's all these weird voices, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur that you have and, you know, you, you want to um, have your return on investment and so forth. But yeah, I understand these are like win-win deals right there. want to talk about product market fit, you know, because we all have different um, versions of product market fit. In my case, I own a cold email agency And I can get product market fit incredibly quickly by launching, you know, new product variants, testing it on various, various audiences and seeing, you know, if there's ignition, obviously then there's a Zoom meetings and then we can uh, sell them on that new product slash service, whether it's a SaaS or um, a service based uh, type of business and see, let's say after 10 meetings, if I can close at least three or four, then we have some kind of a fit. What is your own definition of product market fit and then i do that like 10 times more you know and make sure that it's scalable and i have probably 15 to 25 other business criteria for a startup to be a um, product market fit in my head but like what is yours so let me i want to step back real quick to the previous question before you jumped yeah. into that my, my grandfather had a really good saying about about these businesses yeah. with all that helps quell all those voices in my head he said Don't fall in love with your businesses. Your businesses are there to make you money. That's it, to make your life good and to make you money. At the end of the day, if that business is making you money, and, and you're running a good business, of course, like yeah, we're not, we're not, I'm not talking about an unethical business. If that's a good business yeah. that you're happy with and it's making you money, fantastic. It's doing its job. If if somebody else is getting 40%, I don't care if I'm not working in it. It's just 60% of the, the profit coming from that business into my bank account every month. Fantastic. Correct. One less thing to worry about. Correct, so, correct. you know, so I don't, I don't, I try not to let those voices be oh, out there right. do yeah. it with that, with that idea in my head. So yeah. now the concept on product market fit is exactly the same as what you do. The difference is, I have, a, I, I have instead of, well, actually, I don't know how your, your business works. A lot of times I'm the one, I get on the phone and I make the phone calls. Yeah, I make them too. I mean, as a CEO, yeah. well, as a CEO, um, well, most, the, the best CEOs, are, in my opinion, are selling CEOs, but especially as a visionary and a product market fit guy that ignites the whole thing because I want to do something very similar to what you're doing, already doing it to some extent. Um, yeah, I don't have a choice to hop on those phone calls myself and, uh, talk it out, you know, and yesterday I dropped a newsletter and, you know, these, these things that we're talking about, a lot of entrepreneurs have problems doing that launching new products. They're like, yeah, uh, I, I don't have any experience in that. Uh, how, how will I do it? You know, just like a, a guy that's distributing his, his first CVs. Um, and also they have a, a second problem, which is raising prices. I actually coach a lot of entrepreneurs to do those two things, you know, to launch new products, test them and just raise your frigging prices, you know, um, So it's like, yeah, what, what do you think about that approach to, you know, just launch a, a bunch of emails, get meetings, get feedback, because yeah, I do take these calls myself and 
I, I get feedback and yeah, hopefully I'll get sales as well out of it. So there's, there's one other thing that, that I found that works really, really well. Pick your industry, whatever the thing is, you know, wh wherever you have this idea, and go to a local trade show. Like find a trade show that's going on, go to the trade show and just ask a bunch of people if this is a problem worth solving. Okay. Like if you just, if you sit down and you can go to a trade show and you can talk to a hundred plus people in like a day in our two days about, okay. about if you have this one idea, this one angle, almost always you'll get what, whether that's an idea worth pursuing. Cause you can just ask them right there. Like, would you buy it? Would you buy this thing? I can solve this problem for you right now. Would you buy it? If I, I got it right this minute, you give me money, I'll fix it. If the answer is no, don't go do the thing. And, uh, and then the, on the flip side, the other thing to do on with, if the answer is no is, all right, what is your question? What is the problem you're having? Yeah. You know, th this, this actually happened recently with, with the company that didn't work out that I was talking about, that um, the, uh, we went to a trade show. We realized that the business, given the, the staffing shortage in America, the business was going to be really difficult to make run. Okay. And so we asked at the trade show, the, the, the most recent show we went to, what is the problem you're having? And it was recruitment was the biggest problem. And, I, and it came down to ask her some questions. It was not just recruitment. It was writing great uh, job descriptions. Okay. And so, you know, what we looked at doing, which we ended up not doing, I actually gave this idea to somebody who's, who's more in this industry, is we looked at actually just building an agency that just writes job descriptions for enterprise businesses. And, and does like videos about how great it is to work at that business. Yeah, I mean, HR is humongous. And I have a component of my agency that does cold email for recruitment. I do it for my own business and it works magic. You know, you target specific titles and write up great copy. And then you get on calls with these candidates and, and see if they're a fit. Um, yeah, that's beautiful. Especially if you niche down in one specific niche, you know, like agency for fintech for example recruiting uh, cfos for fintechs for example so um or regulation people com compliance people even better um super super fascinating and, and interesting yeah th this process um the um, conference thing you know for a young guy like me i mean i tried uh, conferences back in the days where it's never really successful kind of also makes me uncomfortable you know to go to people and but i guess that's that's just me you know and i've heard various um successful entrepreneurs talk good stuff about conferences you know and even making sales as well once you have a, a product um so i would implement that one but i'm curious if i could do a version of that with cold email for example just ask a question back directly in the the email and or uh, send them a, a link uh, to a google form do you think that would work as well and i could maybe provide these ideas to some clients or or for myself it would it might work it might work, but I don't, it would not work as well because when you're at a conference, people are not at their desk and they're there to talk about their problems. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to really open up to you. Whereas yeah. if somebody's working at, you know, they're going to be like, look, I got like 10 seconds. Okay. Like, whereas there, they got all the time to talk to you and, yeah. and you're going to be able to delve in and ask tons of questions, uh, you know, and, and all of that. And you were talking about HR. Actually, one of the, the one of the businesses we're spinning up right now is a company called UX Designer Finder. Okay. All that company does <laughs> is find and and recruit UX designers, Love it. agencies, SaaS businesses, and uh, enterprise businesses. So Same, and we have a very similar process. We go through a pretty extensive vetting process. Okay. Very cool. We've got a couple of minutes left, two minutes and a half to be precise. Um, one, I mean, yeah, we need to do a round two, but I have like two more questions. One is um, you're obviously, you know, financially free. I'm not sure since what age exactly, probably around your, your 30s or something like that. Uh, but do you invest mostly in your startups or do you put like your, your money in different um, baskets like uh, stocks and uh, crypto? Great question. Uh, so I make a lot of money off my real estate these days. Really? Uh, I invested in single family homes a while back. Yeah. And then I took some of the really good ones, put them on Airbnb. And I've actually done really surprisingly well off my Airbnb investments. And these wow. days I'm actually starting to invest in other countries and, and also in, in vacation rentals in other countries. I'm actually going down next week to Costa Rica yeah. to take a look at a, a house we're putting up there. 
um, in Santa Teresa, Costa Rica. Yeah. And then, uh, so one is real estate. Um, two, I, I used to do a lot in stocks and bonds, but the, at the end of the day, I don't have enough time to watch it. It goes up, it goes down. One day I'm way up, one day, you know, next year I'm way down. Yeah. I know people that do really well on it, but it's another thing to think about for me. So what I've done, uh, really I've got three major things. I've got my real estate. I've got businesses that I've, I've been an angel investor in and continue to be an advisor in. And a lot of my friends, you know, obviously I have a lot of friends that have businesses. I invest in their businesses. Actually, I just got a really, really amazing investment offer yesterday for a company that's on track for 150 million wow. this year. Nice. Um, so, you know, uh, investments like that, and then, and then in my businesses, and I would say that, I don't know what's my, the majority of my, my assets are in real estate. Cause as I've made money, I put them into real estate uh, and, you know, as a place to kind of store, store, store wealth and then, uh, and generate wealth. Cause it generates cash every single month off of that. And then uh, generating wealth off of my investments and then generating cash once again off my businesses and off my, my, you know, wealth and cash off my businesses. We've got 20 seconds left. Where can people find out more about you real quick? Uh, tangentsolutions.net. It's got my portfolio. You can also look me up at experience.